Wait, where? What? Give me the box! Oh no. No, no! Not the box. This is the Escape the Zoo Podcast. <laughs> With your host, Daniel Clark. Hello there, and welcome back to the Escape the Zoo Podcast, where we talk everything wildlife. Today's guest is Dr. Jody Rowley, a biologist with a focus on amphibian diversity, ecology, and conservation. Jody and her team have discovered a multitude of amphibian species never before known to science and have gone to the most extreme lengths to find them. I found this conversation to be absolutely fascinating. We talk about trekking into remote Cambodian rainforests during monsoon season, getting attacked by leeches in the jungle, benefits amphibians bring to humans and ecosystems, why they are being lost at an unprecedented rate, and how we may be able to help. I hope you enjoy this conversation. So without further ado, here it is, my chat with the one and only Dr. Jody Rowley. Well, Jody, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. My pleasure. I'm super excited to talk. By the time this releases, it'll be about our 30th episode, which is crazy because that means there'll be over 50 hours probably of conversations that I've had about wildlife with wildlife experts. And I'm embarrassed to say that I don't think I have had one conversation about frogs or amphibians or anything of the sort. So I'm super excited to dig in with you because, I mean, they're such an important <laughs> group of animals and it, it's kind of embarrassing that I haven't had those conversations. Well, um, um, yeah, it's about time. Yes, it is certainly about time. And there's nobody better to do it with. I heard or I read online that you've discovered well over 20 species of frogs. Is that true? Yeah, me, with me, me and my colleagues uh, have done a bunch of expeditions, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, into some remote forests, trying to get a better understanding of frogs, including how many species they are, there are. What are uh, some of the more interesting ones that you've discovered? Uh, I guess, to be a little bit corny, I suppose, the vampire <laughs> flying frog is pretty amazing. Whoa. It has a really awesome name. Uh, its Latin name is Racophorus vampirus as well. So, so that's and pretty awesome. And did you awesome. get to name it too? Yeah, we did. And, and we didn't just, so it's a, it's a type of flying frog. So we didn't get to really name that part. So these are tree frogs that are incredibly adapted for life in the canopy. They usually have extremely large hands and feet that are webbed in between their fingers and toes. They often don't need to come to ground. They can have their sort of lay their eggs within the trees in water holes as well. Uh, and so these guys are a type of flying frog, but the vampire part came from their tadpoles. So the adults are quite a, a normal, very beautiful, sort of a red bricky color frog, um, very mm -hmm. typical tree frog, toe pads, webbing, all that. But it's actually their tadpoles that normally tadpoles have kind of like little beaky things with tiny little teeth rows and and it's very intricate but these guys instead of that had two curved black fangs sticking out Whoa. of their mouth uh, and so we just were ah, like this this is a pretty cool frog and I, I think we deserve to call it the the vampire flying frog what was that like to start looking at one of those tadpoles under the microscope and see those fangs you must have been blown away yeah you know i'm not a tadpole expert i'm definitely spent way more time thinking about looking trying to find frogs definitely tadpoles are obviously a part of that though uh, and so i knew it was cool uh, i knew enough about tadpoles to know that this was not your average tadpole but i didn't actually know how cool uh, and i knew i needed to sort of get get the lowdown on how cool it was. So I actually contacted one of a handful of tadpole experts in the world. Um, and he's a retired professor at, in Mississippi. And I wrote him an email and I sent him some photos and sort of, I think, I think this is pretty cool. You know, can you tell me a little more about it? And he wrote back in all capital letters. So that's when I knew that it was, it was really <laughs> cool. And it is definitely one of the strangest tadpoles in the world. Um, the teeth or the, the fangs, and they're not actually fangs per se, uh, but they are black curved things that look like fangs. 
uh, they are actually not used for sucking blood, and fortunately or otherwise, ah. they are actually used to eat. So they, their mother does lay the eggs into a tree hole, and it's a very small body of water in there that's just kind of a tiny little pool with all these tadpoles, and there's not much for them to eat. So she actually comes back to that tree hole and lays unfertilized eggs in there for her babies to eat and they use the fangs to scoop the eggs down whole into their bellies. So so they also have a really cool life history. Is that normal behavior for frogs to eat unfertilized or tadpoles to eat unfertilized eggs outside of this specific species? We don't think so. We don't know a lot about tadpoles in general and what they eat. So we're still trying to figure that out, um, you know, species by species pretty much. But definitely there are amazing examples of parental care in frogs. We tend to think that they just put their eggs out there and hope for the best. And indeed, a lot of frogs do do that. But there are a handful of species that we know of that actually the, the mother does come back and lay unfertilized eggs for them to eat. And they're usually tadpoles that are put in very strange places, like little tiny bits of water in the trees or in bromeliads or something like that where there's nothing else for them to eat whoa that's crazy yeah i had no idea (laughs) so that is one of my favorites for a whole bunch of reasons but the name is also pretty cool it's funny because i think in general you just always you never really think about the details like i've always obviously known that frogs lay eggs they become tadpoles and grow up but i'm always i never even thought about what a tadpole might be eating (laughs) Yeah, there's there's a whole lot of really cool examples. I mean, there's another species of frog that does, um, it's actually the, the father that does most of the care. So he actually builds nests. So it's called Limborg's frog, tiny brown frog, you know, about an inch or, or less uh, in body length. And he actually lives in these very wet forests where there's basically mud and leaf litter on the ground. And he makes a tiny little nest by pushing his nose into the mud. Like, it's pretty hard. Frogs don't have great, you know, digging implements. Um, But he pushes his nose around in circles until he gets a nice little polished circular nest about his size. And he calls from that nest under the leaf litter, waiting for a female. Once he attracts a female and they lay eggs, he actually guards that nest. Um, And it's pretty cool, too, because it means that fish and other predators can't get it because he's on a little body of water himself. Now, there's no food. They don't supply food to those tadpoles, but these tadpoles actually have their own little yolk sacs. So you can see when they they are born, they have sort of white stuff in their belly and they actually just feed off of this yolk uh, until they turn into a baby frog. So they don't need to eat at all. So that's another strategy for the frogs use to to make make sure their babies survive or at least some of them, hopefully, give them a better chance in life because it's a scary world out there. That's wild. I think in general, I always say how the the more and more you dig into specific species of animals, it's crazy, the the uniqueness. And and I don't know, in general, I think most people think of a frog as a frog. And once you start thinking of there's thousands of, what is it, like 10,000 species of frogs out there, and each one of them has all these different unique life cycles and behavioral characteristics, it's super interesting. Yeah, it's, it's insane. And we and at a, the most basic level, we don't even know how many frog species we have in the world yet. We're discovering on average at least 100 new species of frog a year. Uh, and Whoa. at the same time, we're losing species as well. And in many right. cases, we'll be losing species before we even know that they exist, which is one of the drivers for, for what I'm trying to do in my work is to try and figure out what we've got so that we hopefully also know how amazing it is, how awesome it is, what we stand to lose. And also so that we can make more informed conservation decisions because we're not able to save everything on the planet, but we need to try and figure out how we can save as much as we can of the amazing biodiversity that we have, including these awesome frogs. Yeah. And you can't protect what you don't even know exists in the first place. I had never really realized how dire of a situation the amphibian amphibian community is facing until I read The Sixth Extinction by Elizabeth Colbert. And she mentions how Kittred has basically wiped out so much of the amphibian population in South America. And really, it's the most threatened group of animal or class of species in the world right now. Uh, Has that improved at all? What's the current state of amphibians? Uh, Can you just provide a little bit more light there? 
Yeah, so that, that's exactly right. When we think of endangered animals, people tend to think of the big fluffy things, you know, the rhinos and the tigers, but it's always my um, plea for, for us to also think of the frogs. So you're, you're totally right. Frogs are amongst the most threatened group of animals on the planet. 42% of all amphibians, so that's frogs, salamanders, Sicilians, newts, toads, are threatened with extinction, 42%. And, and that's just the wow. ones that we know about. That's insane. You know, we've already lost probably at least 100 species. And I say probably because we're sort of still debating whether some have completely gone. And thankfully, we're also making discoveries. And then there's also the frogs that we don't, you know, know that even existed and have probably also disappeared right. as well. Uh, so the declines happened generally in the kind of 80s and 90s were when things really started to to start tipping. Um, people started noticing there wasn't a lot of people out there monitoring the frog population. So it was only sort of a handful of people in different part, places around the world. And then when there was a big international conference and these people came together, it was kind of like, oh, my frogs are starting to disappear at my study site. Oh my gosh, you know, mine are too, mine are too. And that's when everyone realized, yeah uh-oh, like something serious is going on. So the amphibian chytrid fungus was the most, I guess, worrying of all of the things that was happening because at the time when the frogs started disappearing, many of the disappearances and declines were from national parks or apparently really mm -hmm. pristine places where you would expect that all of your animals are protected, right? Uh, right. And so when we actually realised that the reason for most of these declines was this type of fungus an amphibian chytrid fungus um then the big thing is what can we what can we do about it um and and that's one of the biggest problems we still we can do little things we can try and captive breed um but we can't get this thing out of the environment once it's there and unfortunately we've probably spread it us humans through the pet trade through moving frogs around the world frogs were used for pregnancy tests for quite a long time as well and so Anyone moving a frog. Uh, so they would use African That's... clawed frogs, which are an aquatic frog, uh, and they would keep them in tanks and they would get the human pee that they would use to test whether a lady was pregnant or not and put it into the water. <laughs> and if that frog then sort of developed eggs, uh, then the, the lady was pregnant. Uh, and so it was the hormones in, in the female pee that actually induced a response in the frog as well. So, Whoa, <laughs> yeah, that frogs, is bizarre. Frogs are, I guess, pretty useful. They, they might not have had the most fun on that, that journey. But, um, yes, yeah, so we've moved frogs <laughs> yeah, that, around the world. That's a rough gig. And, and so we think that we've moved the diseases from potentially Asia around the world and all our frogs are, you know, in Australia, in the US, all these places that haven't evolved with this disease were just completely decimated by it. And it, it attacks the kind of Achilles heel of frogs. So it attacks their skin. Frogs uh, have amazing skin that they use to drink, that many of them use to breathe quite a lot. Um, and so once you disrupt that in the frogs, then, you know, we went from places like you mentioned in Central America where there was 80 species and you could just go there and it would just be, you know, every few metres or every or less probably that you would see a frog and all of a sudden there was only a handful of frogs left and then the forests were almost silent and that started to happen around the world. So in Australia we lost at least four species of frog due to that amphibian chytrid fungus. Um, there are other threats to frogs though, so that's one of the biggest things is that it's not just this one disease. They're incredibly sensitive to habitat loss or even very mm -hmm. what we would think of very minor changes to, to habitat because they're so tied into it. Uh, pollution, particularly because of their, their skin. Climate change, because they're so sensitive to any moisture or temperature. Um, introduced species, you know, you name it. So it is a little bit of a perfect storm um, of threats that are impacting amphibians around the world. And we do, thankfully, have some good news stories. So there's been you know, a bunch of rediscoveries in, in recent decades of frogs that we thought were extinct. There's been some amazing successful stories of conservation actions working, of frogs being released into the wild and, you know, surviving after captive breeding or the work in Australia that's been done on the Crawberry frog to make sure this tiny little frog still exists in the wild. But it, it is not that often that we get good news on the frog front, unfortunately. They are still copying it, you know, and and we really need to start paying attention to those little guys because they are really like the canaries in the coal mines. So they're, if they're dropping, then we need to start being concerned about our own health as well. Yeah, and 
with the chytrid, is it something where the amphibians in Asia have a larger resistance to it than South America and Australia and the places where they've dropped significantly? Yeah, we think so. It's only a recent discovery that it actually came out of Asia. It's been it's taken a very oh, okay. long time to kind of figure that out. And certainly not all species of frog are, are affected to the same degree. Uh, some frogs, even in Australia and the US and, and the Americas, are quite resistant to it for some reason. And so there's a lot of investigation as to how much that might be immune response, how much that might be the secretions that they have on their skin to stop each mm-hmm. different species getting infected, or how much the microbes that live on their skin play a part in that as well. Uh, also, the f- behavior of the frogs influence things as well. If a frog hangs out in nice, cool rainforest streams near the water, it's perfect fungus temperature. And so they're potentially a lot more likely to get uh, sort of done in by the amphibian chytrid fungus compared to a frog that that might be in quite a dry, arid area. So it's it's still an ongoing threat. It does seem that some frogs are learning to, or I guess evolving to, if they've survived the first hit, uh, persist with the disease. But it's just another thing that's sort of knocking them on the head and, and, and impacting populations. Yeah, because when I read The Sixth Extinction, it looked uh, to be a morbid situation. Like the, the way I read it was that we're losing 80 plus percent of these amphibians and there's really no cure to this chytrid coming in the near future. Is it something where science has made improvements to help protect them? Or is it more just that this, the amphibians that have survived are the ones that just naturally have some way of fighting off this, this bacteria? Um, there's is it a, it's not a bacteria, is it? A fungus. Yeah. It's, it's a really a fungus, t- weird sorry. type of sort of basal fungus. Um, yeah, look, I think there's certainly been cases of where we have helped things not go extinct and maybe we've pushed it sort of so that it might be able to persist in the wild. But there's certainly really hopeful cases of frogs that we, you know, in Australia in particular, um, the waterfall frog and the Australian lace-led frog, they disappeared from mountain tops. So they used to be all the way up to sort of 600 metres in Australia. Our mountains are pretty small. Um, and then <laughs> they they disappeared from the tops. But now we're no- noticing that they're actually coming back up. So they're recolonising some of the streams that they disappeared from. So, oh, that's and, cool. and they're doing that themselves as well. So it, it, it is hopefully the case that if, if the, the, the populations can survive, at least some of them, then they, they should be able to hopefully evolve um, it's just when you take into account all the other things going on at once, there's, you know, cyclones and, and deforestation and introduced species as, as well that the poor little frogs have to cope with. Yeah, and I think it's, it's amazing. And I don't know if we fully understand how sensitive certain animals are to even the smallest changes in their ecosystem. I was reading this success. It's a super sad story that turned into a success story about this frog in Tanzania that was somehow the only place that it could really proliferate was under this waterfall because the misting of the waterfall just set the perfect uh, ecosystem around for them to do really well. And then Tanzania built this dam and sure enough, they all pretty much died out almost immediately. But thankfully somebody noticed and got a small breeding population, took them into captive breeding worked with the Tanzanian government and then brought them back and reintroduced them. And they built this weird spray device to basically allow them to continue to live, which is encouraging that it's cool that they found out how to fix them. But it's also something that you would never imagine, like just stopping this one waterfall in this one area would completely ruin an entire species of animal. It's pretty wild. It, it is. It is really crazy how adapted frogs can be. And I guess that's one of the reasons that they've diversified. There's a all, you know, a, there's a really different environment, even if it's just over there. And so they just end up evolving this species that's so tightly adapted to its environment. And that's one of the things that makes them so vulnerable to any kind of environmental change, whether it's damming, uh, you know, mm-hmm. or whether it's sort of some kind of pollution or climate change. So that's where we're like increasingly starting to get really worried about frogs because they that many species do operate in a very sort of tight environmental space that they thrive in, but you push them a little bit outside of that and they just can't handle it. You mentioned that they're essentially the canaries in the coal mine to alert 
folks at bigger problems are going on within these e ecosystems. Why frogs? And it, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so frogs have really permeable skin uh, and they have the sort of biphasic lifestyle. So typically they have a tadpole state that lives in the water and then they move on to the land and they form really important functions in both those ecosystems. Um, and they're exposed to all the kinds of threats in both those ecosystems as well. Their skin essentially sucks in most of, of everything that's in the water. So pollution, uh, other chemicals, hormones, any, anything that we put in the environment, their skin kind of sucks it in. So frogs don't drink. You'll never see a frog like lapping at a bowl like you would see a dog. Um, they actually just have a thing called a drink patch on their belly and they'll just sit in a puddle or they'll sit in the water and they will drink through their belly. So they will drink oh, anything we put in there as well, which is one of the reasons that makes them very susceptible to things. Um, and, and another reason is that they're incredibly tied to a water environment. So some of them have just gone crazy. They live in deserts. They've adapted by burrowing down, you know, deep and forming cocoons basically underground, but they are still a freshwater organism and they still need rains. They still need the deserts to flood, to breed. Um, and so they're always in whatever they do, they are still tied very much to water. So any changes in moisture, humidity, the frequency mm -hmm. of rainfall events is, is, is a real problem. And of course they're cold blooded or ectothermic. So whatever temperature their environment is, is whatever temperature they get to be. So they can move around in it. They can sit in a hotter or a cooler place, but they can't make their body any different temperature to sort of what's around them more or less. Um, so that's one of the reasons that they are, I guess, responding to environmental change before other animals because they so are they are so tied to it. Um, and we do notice when frogs disappear as well. So not only are they canaries in the coal mine, but they're also a huge and important keystone sort of part of most ecosystems in that when they disappear, you notice the flow on effects. So the invertebrates change, the snakes, reptiles, mammals, birds that used to rely on frogs for food start to disappear as well. So we, we really do need these things to stick around. We need our frogs. <laughs> yeah. I think unfortunately when so much of the world has become urbanized, even for me, it's hard to picture because I live in LA what the collapse of an ecosystem would actually matter to me. I mean, outside of altruistic purposes, and obviously you want to protect the wildlife, but you almost have this feeling that you're invincible because you're in a concrete jungle and there's really very little around me that has anything to do seemingly with an ecosystem, but ultimately it's all a downstream thing and it's, it's very short-sighted to think that way. Yeah, we've, it's, it is a very, very dangerous thing. And look, I grew up in the city. I had kind of city parents, you know, in, I grew up in Sydney. They didn't really, I don't really, I think maybe when I was like really small, we went camping once, but we, we weren't an outdoor group of people. And so it was sort of a, a miracle that I ended up really, I guess, quite late when I did environmental science degree at university. And we went out into the forest at night and I saw these frogs and because I was so disconnected, I couldn't believe these things were real. You know, these amazing, they almost look fake, you know, big eyeballs, toe pads, these precious <laughs> animals yeah. just sitting on these leaves by the stream. And it was that realization that these things exist, that these things need our help. I mean, I think everybody should, should have the opportunity to stand in a chorus of frogs, you know, in the first rain. There is nothing more amazing and, and more connecting than than standing in a swamp or at the edge of a swamp, if that's not your thing, and just hearing <laughs> the life around you. And and that makes you realise as well of how abundant frogs are or should be. So even as we go walking, you know, even five minutes from my apartment in pretty urban, suburban Sydney, there's a frog calling down the street. You know, I'll walk a bit further, yeah. I might get another. If I walk for 20 minutes, I can find a, a threatened frog that lives in the leaf litter um, that's called the red crown toad with a little red head and it's threatened by habitat loss because it lives in the kind of places that we live in uh, and any kind of changes to the water flow uh, will actually wipe these guys out as well. So 
it's there. But most people just, even if you're out jogging in the bush or walking your dogs, you don't know that that noise, that is a frog and that is an amazing frog. And it's only in this small part in Sydney. And, you know, we're so privileged to have this little guy and what you do actually does affect the frogs. So I, I guess I talk a lot about frogs and, and telling people, trying to tell people how amazing frogs are. You know, I've been so privileged to see so many amazing species of frogs be in so many places in the world uh, where it's they it's just such a beautiful place that I at least try and tell people as well yeah like not there's not just one type of frog they don't all go ribbit and <laughs> and and they're just they're absolutely amazing and I, I hope that I could share a little bit of my passion and enthusiasm and inspire someone to to walk the dog a little further and and have a look to see what local frogs they might have yeah and <clears throat> I think also there's just there was certain environments, especially in the rainforest. My girlfriend went on vacation to I think it was Saint Lucia last year, and she'd Facetime me like at night before bed, and I could barely hear her because the frogs were just insane. And I was like, I have never heard anything remotely close to that. Um, but also, I, I think it's such a natural animal for kids to learn about wildlife i mean my entire childhood was hanging around ponds and lakes trying to catch these things um which i'm sure isn't great for them but like as a kid it's just like a fun thing to do it's just sad to think that they do feel like such a vulnerable species comparatively to other things just because of how soft their their skin is and how susceptible they are to certain diseases and i don't know i just think it's amazing that you're making this strong push to help them out. Yeah, they. I mean, they need it. So there are a lot of people, thankfully, around the world that, that are working on frogs in different parts of the world. And there are some good news stories. But comparatively, you know, there there's not enough people and, and there's not enough people that care. And so actually one of the things that I've been working on for the last, uh, I guess, several years now, but that's been going for more than a year, is a citizen science project called Frog ID in Australia. And it's a national project. And part of that is getting the information that we need to conserve frogs. So in Australia, as in many parts of the world, we still don't know how many frog species we have. We don't know where they are, really. We don't know how they're doing. And there's not that many frog biologists. So Australia is pretty big and remote. There's lots of places where no one's ever recorded, you know, put records of frogs on the map. So this project has been utterly amazing and we've got more than 50,000 um, submissions so far from across oh, Australia. Wow. Look, it's utterly amazing. The scientific outcomes are just fantastic. We're getting more knowledge so rapidly about frogs than we have, you know, in the last several decades easily. Oh, but that's crazy. One of the coolest things apart from the science is the connection that people are getting with their local frogs. So it's a smartphone app. You go outside, you hear a frog, you just press record. Um, each species of frog has a different call. And so then somebody like myself will listen to that, identify all the frogs that are calling and, and let, let you know on your phone. And to hear, you know, because it's a recording, we get to hear all the kids and they're getting so excited and, you know, their parents might be telling them, shh, you know, we're trying to record a frog. Um, and some of the feedback from people, you know, people that are, you know, 60 years old, live in the outback and have said, I've lived here all my life, but I've never paid attention to frogs. You know, I never really looked around. Now that's all I hear and see. And I'm so excited. People that are driving the long way to the supermarket and stopping on all the ponds on the way, people oh, that decide that. to do road trips at night so they can stop along. You know, we had someone recording frogs along this really remote stretch of highway and they went you know, hundreds of kilometers in a couple of days just stopping and recording frogs at every ditch which is utterly amazing so it's it's anything I can do to get that connection and and these people are, are hopefully getting a better appreciation or at least knowing what frogs live around them but also they are contributing to our understanding of frogs like never before oh so they get the feedback as to what they're recording or what photo they're taking of yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's gamifying it to a certain degree because you look at things like um, there was the new Pokemon on, on uh, your phone that blew up over the last like year and was such a phenomenon where you could go out in the in New York City and find certain Pokemon living around and try and capture them. I think a lot of it is the feedback aspect of it. It's It's being able to go out and say, I found this. I wonder if there's like the one in a million chance that this is something nobody's ever seen before, or I would love to learn what this possibly is. or And then you start garnering an appreciation for it. And 
in it's very similar to what you were saying, which is I remember when I'd go out and buy a car and <clears throat> you're looking at all these different types of models, which one I should get, I don't know. And then all of a sudden you're driving on the road and because you have that lens through which you're looking at the world, you're like, oh my God, I didn't know so many people drove X car and I was going to buy Y car, but everybody on the road has that. Maybe I should get Z car. And I think once you just open your mind up to actually looking for these things and trying to find them, and then you have that feedback loop that you almost feel like you're collecting and you're you're a part of something, uh, it's so powerful in the way that you can get like an open sourced network effect and, and get the general population to care about it. it. I don't know. It's really encouraging. Yeah, it's it's been really inspiring. And I think... I guess I went into this project thinking more about the frog outcomes this, in terms of the, oh, we, we need to know where they are, we need to know how they're doing, all of these records are scientific data points, you know, and it's actually come over time to to believe that the the connection aspect, you know, the having the people going out and, the you know, the kids being involved is maybe even more important <laughs> than the data yeah. on the frogs themselves because it's, you know, it's actually, and it's connected me a lot more as well to the whole country and, and the frogs around the country. It's also made me slightly, I'm so used to listening to frog calls and identifying them. So I sit with headphones on uh, usually a couple of hours a day at least and identify <laughs> the noises of frogs from around Australia. It's utterly amazing. You know? So I get to be on wild. public transport in Sydney, you know, with earphones on listening to sounds of frogs from the forest. And it, yeah, it's absolutely <laughs> amazing. But now I hear frogs like it's like I've got some kind of weird hearing. If a frog calls in the distance and I'm having a conversation with someone, I'm like, parents tree frog. <laughs> and then, <laughs> like just start identifying noises and everything sounds almost like a frog to me. So I've definitely got my frog <laughs> lens on the world. Uh, <laughs> what would you say your ability to, like what's your natural database of being able to hear a sound and recognize to the specific species what frog that is? Are we talking hundreds? So Australia has 240 known species of frog plus the introduced cane toad. Um, it's depend so it, it's very hard if you get given a frog that's sort of a rare frog and no one tells you where in Australia it's from. It is really quite mm -hmm. amazing the, your, how your brain must work. The state filter, if I know what state it is from, it works much better because the database must be 240 is too big for my brain at once. Generally, there's some easy frogs that you hear all the time that you know automatically, but having mm -hmm. the location and the call um, for the most part, it's pretty instant. When we started this project, I wasn't as good. And we've got a database of the calls that we know of, and we would, I'd have to listen to them and sort of check again, which one was which, but I think I've probably listened to 20,000 calls uh, sort of over the last, how long some of them with as many as 11 species calling at once so you've got to listen Whoa. and yeah. sometimes you have to listen for or what are the possible frogs that could be in this area because sometimes my brain filters out a frog in the background or something so it, you've got to listen to it quite a lot of times uh, but it's a skill that I now have so I, Dude, it that, makes me a better yeah. biologist in the field as well because I used to go out in the field and forget what frogs made what noise but now that's never happening again they're all burnt into my brain <laughs> that's fascinating i love that i feel like that's like the perfect application for some machine learning software to just be able to plug that in and i mean deal with such more data as possible is that something you're working on yes yes that would be amazing so that's definitely what we're hoping to achieve so we didn't previously have the database of frog calls that would allow us to do that. There wasn't that many calls in existence and you really need a library, you know, of, of hundreds of, of each species for the computers to be able to sort of artificially figure that out. Now we finally have that. There, I think there, there will always be some issues in choruses of 11 sure. species. I think that in those cases, the human ear might actually be a bit better. But with your old yeah. striped marsh frog or green tree frog or some of the common you know, backyard recorded frogs, our hopes are that that will be able to also, the, the other benefit of that would potentially be automatic feedback for people. So it takes a little while for us to listen uh, to each yeah. call, but for the phone to be able to say in a Shazam manner, you know, th this is this frog or we're pretty sure that this is this frog would be, would be really cool as well. Yeah. And also 
it's worth waiting to find out that you've actually had such success in engaging people before you spend the money on trying to figure out how to build that software. But the fact that so many people are engaged in using that is so encouraging, not only for that specific project, but it, it really does finding any way to get more and more people connected to the natural world is getting more and more difficult. So I think that's so amazing. And then you could even, I mean, I'm just brainstorming weird ways you could expand on it, which is, oh, we're, we're really trying to work on this specific area that is a harder place to camp or not an, a, a usual place that people go out and camp. And then all of a sudden you have these amphibian renegades going out and you can plan your weekends around where more data is needed, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, that would that would be absolutely amazing. Um, and we're learning so much every day. It seems silly to to not know, for example, when the frog breeding seasons are. The bird people are, you know, they they know when their bird breeding season is, and they're you know yeah. right on that, and they're just blown away by the fact that in you know we don't really have any real data for most frog species, and occasionally we'll have it from one area, and we'll know that the frogs in this place, you know, someone's done a study over a year, and that's when they breed, but. We, we don't even have a handle on the basic kind of stuff that we're going to need to be able to understand how frogs are responding to climate change because we don't know what they did before. We don't know what they're yeah. doing now. So it's even just that real baseline data that we need on on frogs. And it's not just Australia. I mean, this is a project that we started in Australia, but almost every country in the world has a really poor, in fact, I would say every country in the world has a relatively poor understanding of they're frogs. They, they're tricky. they mostly out at night. They mostly love it when it's raining. So it's all this kind mm-hmm. of human <laughs> related things. I mean, <laughs> when all the other biologists come out of the forest in the monsoon season in Asia, for example, that's when I go in and they're like, have fun in the pouring rain with the leeches. Um, oh, so yeah. frogs, frogs can be tricky. And if the weather conditions are not just right, then they won't be out as well. So it's very difficult for, for me or any frog biologist to plan a trip to get frogs. You almost have to be just Johnny on the spot when it starts raining uh, and, and record frogs or document the frogs in some way. Yeah. And it's so important to find out about those breeding purposes for other reasons too, where I was camping in Ojai of probably six months ago now. Uh, which is just north of LA, probably about two or three hours. And we came across this lake and I drove into the lake and we pulled up right beside the shoreline and went outside and we were just going to kind of take some pictures. There were some birds around. And I noticed when I got out of the car that there were we were literally surrounded by probably 500 tiny little frogs, like couldn't have been more than a couple centimeters large. And then the first thing that's going on in my head is how many of these did I just run over driving in? I felt horrible about myself. And then I'm trying to back out and I would I found like a weird way to try and shoo them out of the <laughs> out of the road so I could drive and not hit all of them and that took me an hour longer to get out of this little driveway than it should have. But what really upset me is we went on a hike the next day and they had a sign talking about how these were very endangered frogs. And I'm like, how is it possible that there's hundreds of these super endangered frogs and there wasn't anybody blocking off these areas? We weren't the only car there. I'm sure hundreds of them were getting hit a day. And maybe it just is that people didn't know when their breeding season was and weren't able to rope that off. Or it's just a sheer apathetic standpoint, which would be even worse. Yeah, it, could, it definitely it could be that, that they didn't know exactly where they were breeding. Maybe they hadn't bred in that pond. That's the other thing about frogs. They can move quite far. You know, a frog can move a kilometre in a night, um, depending on the species. It could also be that no one has the resources to to get up there and, and stand there. They're too busy trying to, you know, work on another part of the project or you do something else. It is really hard to get the resources you need for wildlife conservation. And for that's sure. one of the good things about crowdsourcing, you know, is that for the, there's no way you could fund all these frog biologists going around <laughs> to everywhere in the country <laughs> to record what's there. Um, so it is it is always a challenge. And 
that's one of the hardest things working in any kind of wildlife or conservation is that you've got to understand that not everything can be saved because we don't have an infinite amount of money. And we also, humans, we need to do you know a bunch of other things as well. We need to eat, we need to, to live. Um, and so it is always a bit of a trade-off. And so we just need the information that we, so we can make the most smart decisions and hopefully we will regret the least in the future or our kids will hate us the least in the future for what we've done. Yeah. But it also, I mean, technologies like the one that you're working on is, is a way to engage people. So maybe one of those five cars that was at that pond one day knew what was going on and could help spread the word. Are you? Is it going to be re- released outside of Australia anytime soon? Australia is definitely step one. Um, there's enough phone calls <laughs> at the moment. But yeah, it would be great to have this kind of understanding. I mean, there are different citizen science projects that focus on different things that use apps or the website. And uh, some of them are just for a small area working on maybe a type of butterfly. Others are, you know, will take photographs of absolutely everything. Uh, so there are lots of ways that people can get involved and get more into it. And people definitely do. So I'm hoping citizen science is it is really an emerging sort of thing um, that hopefully it will take off like Pokemon. And it, it has to, <laughs> to quite a certain extent because you're finding these amazing animals and you're actually making a, potentially a real difference yeah. to their survival. So it's all, all really just about getting the word out to people as well about all the things that exist that you can actually, instead of just, you know, you're going camping already, you're sitting by a lake. If you hear a frog calling, press record, you know, and right. really really big discoveries can can be made by that as well. I mean, we've had frog species that are, are known sort of across the northern part of Australia and we have pretty patchy understanding of where they occur. And we had a guy that was recording frogs using Frog ID and he made a 100-kilometre range extension. So we didn't know that this frog occurred in that spot at all. The closest record was 100 kilometres away, which Whoa. is, is uh, you know, a huge amount. Yeah. Um, and he was within, he said, sort of 50 metres from his beer fridge. So he would get home from work, crack <laughs> open a, a can of beer, and then just press record around him. And he made a really significant discovery. So it's there is so much that we still have to know. So we're at this really weird point in time, I think, where it's both incredibly terrifyingly pessimistic on many fronts. You know, things are disappearing. Things are not good at all. But we're also at a really exciting time where we've got this increased sort of technology. We've got citizen science happening. We've we've got a much better understanding and we're getting a much better understanding of things. And we actually have the opportunity right now to make huge contributions to our understanding of biodiversity and act to save it as well. So it can get really doom and gloom working in conservation, working in any sure. kind of wildlife field, but it is also now's the time and we, we've got an opportunity here so it is really really exciting that we can change the future and we can make sure that we have most of the animals and wildlife and wild places that we currently have into the future um, and so i think yeah as terrifying as it can be it's also really exciting and empowering because it things have not gone too far but this is the time to make sure they don't yeah yeah it, it's the inflection point and amen to that i love that can you walk me through, you mentioned that the monsoon season, Southeast Asia and Cambodia, it's the time everybody gets out of the jungle and you're going into these rainforests, into the swamps. Can you walk me through what that process is like? Like when you did discover that vampire flying frog, who are you going with? How are you getting there? What's it like being in the rainforest at that time? Because it seems like a pretty intense endeavor. Yeah, so I think my, my PhD in the wet tropics in the rainforest of North Queensland prepared me a little bit. So to work in a rainforest, <laughs> rainforest looks so beautiful from photos <laughs> and in the outside and they yeah. are so beautiful. But they are really tough places for humans to, to live in. Everything is spiky, stings, you know, you grow fungus on your skin. I'm very, you know, I have all of the medical things that I start, oh, here comes the fungus. I can smell the fungus on, you know, my clothes and everything. Uh, yeah. So it's it prepared me a little. So I, I moved to Cambodia after I finished my PhD, and that was about twelve years ago. Uh, and we, I, I decided that it was the most useful thing that I could do would be to help document the frogs. 
uh, document where they are and how they're doing. So it was a bit of a biodiversity black hole and we didn't know what to prioritise and what was most important because we didn't know what biodiversity existed in most of these places. So I... I formed uh, relationships with different institutions in Cambodia and Vietnam and some amazing colleagues, particularly at universities and museums in Vietnam and Cambodia. And we would then usually train a bunch of students in amphibian biology together and then we would go into the forest in teams. So it would usually be myself, colleagues from universities or museums from Vietnam and Cambodia and usually at least a couple of students. So it would be their baptism of fire in terms of, of working <laughs> in, in biodiversity conservation and field research. We would then usually coordinate, usually it was a protected area, so there would be national park staff um, and a few of them would come. So we'd end up in the end with a big group of people that would be going into the field, usually somewhere between eight and, and ten people. Oh, wow. Um, and getting into the field would be the first problem. So most, yeah, all the primatologists, all the botanists are out of the field now. It's starting to pour and this is the perfect time that I want to be in. So the roads become a challenge. They become almost like quicksand in many places. So usually we will try and get as far as we can on a sealed road and then as far as we can maybe in a minivan um, up to a sort of a village. Then we might try, we'll usually stay there a night, talk to the local guys, get advice on the trails that sort of go into the forest. Uh, maybe some, some of those guys will help us carry all of our gear. Mainly food is the biggest weight of things. Mm. Uh, to catch, you know, do the frog surveys, you just need sort of your camping gear and, um, you know, a, a dry bag with some clothes in it because you'll have to have one dry set of clothes if you can possibly help it to sleep in. Uh, and then we'll maybe on the back of motorbikes go a little further. There's some serious motorbike skills the locals have of sort of driving on yeah. road roads. And then it will be by foot. Uh, occasionally it's been then by boat as well. So one of the benefits of it being the wet season is the rivers are a little higher. So we might be able to get a boat a little further into the forest and then it's hiking. And hopefully there are some trails in the forest that we can follow, but not always. Our aim is, is usually to get to some streams that are high elevation that are likely to have frogs that nobody's ever seen before. Certainly no, no scientist has ever seen before. We will camp in the forest, usually hammocks. So um, everyone kind of lines up like sardines along a, a frame that we'll, we'll make in the forest as, as base camp and there'll be tarp over us like plastic tarp. Um, every night we will go out into a new place in the forest. We might leave in the afternoon um, and we'll walk for three or four hours up the mountain as far as we can get, wait for it to get dark, maybe eat cold rice out of a bag as we wait for it to get dark. <laughs> and then we survey for frogs until usually the early hours of the morning. And then we sleep in those hammocks and then we get up um, and then usually, you know, we're writing all the notes, we're taking photographs of the frogs. Um, and then we might move camp or we might stay there and survey another place as well. So it's living and working in often pouring rain. So sometimes we're up at night holding the, the plastic tarp up so that we don't get everything flooded. Um, but it's been privileged to be in these amazing parts of the world with amazing, amazing frogs. There's, there's nothing like hearing the forest start to come alive as you wait for it to get dark and hearing these noises of frogs that you just have absolutely no idea what they are. And in some cases, they are an undescribed species of frog that's calling from the forest, which, which is an absolute privilege. And working with some of, you know, working with amazing colleagues and there's no quicker way to become lifelong friends or almost family than, <laughs> right. than working with people like I have for the last 10 years in some really difficult conditions in, in the forest, but with one single goal, which is to try and understand what frog species are where and how we save them. Yeah, but <clears throat> I just, I'm gaining such an appreciation for you say that like, oh yeah, like it's pouring rain and we sleep under this frame and a tarp like anchovies in these hammocks. <laughs> That's it. That's a wild, wild and intense endeavor. Like going into, you're basically saying, I want to go find the craziest stream that's on the tallest mountain in the most remote place possible at the worst time of year to do it. 
and I'm going to be like battling through like intensely thick jungle to make that happen. That's it. I mean, there's very, very few people in this world that would want to take that on. It's not, it's definitely not for everyone. I, I, I do admit <laughs> you know that you're alive. It, you know, I, the older I get, I think the more I'm like, oh man, I'm too old for this. This is just horrible. You know, it's, but it is one of these things where all the horrible things fade after time and you just have these amazing photos, these amazing friendships, these amazing discoveries. Sure. It's tough. I'm not saying that I don't count down the days when I'm in the field on how many days we have left of this. You know, you do really appreciate the ability to, you know, I, I remember one morning I was lying in my hammock and you're in your sort of the, the cotton inner hammock sheet thing and then you're usually it's actually quite cold people laugh because if we're working in the lowlands it can be quite hot obviously it's you know in vietnam sure, and cambodia yeah. but once you get up to a thousand meters or more and it's that damp kind of coolness and you're tired and you haven't eaten that much it can be really really fungus cold. is growing yeah and the fungus is growing yeah <laughs> so I was, I was lying in my hammock and i i really wanted to sleep but i kept feeling like i was really sticky on my legs and I'm like, oh, I, I don't really want to investigate what it is, but I guess, you know, I, I better. But it's such an ordeal when it's raining outside, the ground's wet, you've got to get out of your hammock, but try not to get your sleeping bag and everything wet at the same time. Anyway, so I pulled it down eventually and my legs were just covered in blood. And there had been one of these leeches that they call blue Ooh. leeches over there. And I had seen someone with a blue leech before. And I honestly thought they'd rip their leg open. And then when they washed the blood off, it was just this tiny little hole. So these leeches just have amazing anticoagulant powers. Anyway, so I just would, I had like congealed blood from my knees to my feet. And it was, you know, three o'clock in the morning. And I'm thinking, all oh, my friends back in Sydney are in their nice, warm, cozy beds, all dry, <laughs> sleeping soundly. And I'm wiping congealed blood off my legs, like from the leech. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just... I'm like, what am I doing? But I mean, yeah, then you appreciate the ability to sleep in a dry bed later. I can tell you that. Yeah, I'm just trying to stay conscious right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have an incredibly poor ability to look at blood, hear about wow. blood, think about blood. It, yeah, it's like I'm literally like I'm shaking. That sounds so <laughs> that's like my worst nightmare. Um, yeah, did you I find mean, the, did you have to peel the leech off or was it gone? Oh, it was gone I, already. So it had obviously come off and, and I think I found it in my sleeping bag and I just flicked it away. But yeah, that, that is, I won't talk too much in case you pass out. That wouldn't be the greatest. Uh, no. but, oh, yeah, but yeah, I mean, the, the leeches are a definite thing over there, especially, um, it's regularly people see blood on the ground and everyone's like, okay, whose leech is it? And everyone just checks themselves. Uh, and I, I think I've probably had about 40 on me at one time. Oh, yeah. I used to do a, a trip up to like really northern Maine with my cousin and my aunt, my uncle when I was a kid every year. And I always grew up, uh, I grew up on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. So I was always an ocean person. And it was the only time I ever swam in fresh water. And I saw a leech swimming in the water when I was there and I never wanted to go into fresh water ever again. I'm just like such, a, such an ocean person. I could swim in the ocean all day long, but I won't go. I'll do it, but I'll be uncomfortable the whole time because of one leech that I saw 20 years ago. It just freaks me I'm, out. Like I'm definitely the other way. They're Oceans alien are creatures. not my home. But fresh really? water, yeah. Well, the, the one thing is that mo the, in Australia and in, in Asia, the vast majority of leeches anyway are terrestrial. So they're actually not in the water. They're in wettish places in the forest, but you get them, they're just hanging on vegetation as you walk past and, oh, and they're yeah. on the ground crawling towards you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. But I mean, I think that, to your point, like it's always a weird thing where, the most important things, or at least my belief is the most important things that you can accomplish in life when you're actually doing them are not necessarily very enjoyable in the moment. It's really when you're pushing yourself to the absolute extreme. It's it's kind of similar to hiking a massive mountain, right? Like I climbed Mount Fuji with my girlfriend a few years ago. And during the time, like you're like, I'm tired. This is exhausting. I mean, you, you're recognizing that you're in a beautiful place doing a beautiful thing. But there's still a piece of it that you're like, I just can't wait to be back in my bed eating like a pork bun or something like that. And 
but but I look back on that and when you get to the top and when you have those stories, when you have those experiences, when you have pictures of frogs that nobody's seen before, you you really the 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 times you look back on is the most important and valuable times of your life for the times where in the moment it was a really difficult thing to be doing. I I just think all good things really come from an in uh, an inordinate amount of stress, I guess is the best way of putting it. I think so. And I think it's also, it's whatever you're passionate about. I mean, you talk about climbing mountains. I've climbed um, a, a mountain in northern Vietnam, Mount Fancy Pan, which now has a cable car, but um, it a bunch of times, but I never reached the summit because I don't care about that. There's no frogs up that extra 200 meters. Why would I go? <laughs> yeah, I'm so close. I, love that. I could say that I've done it, but I mean, it's it's horrible and there's no benefit to me personally. I it, it doesn't do it for me climbing a mountain for the mountain. I climb mm-hmm. the mountains for the frogs. And so everyone I laughs, you know, that why don't you just literally climb up 200 meters? Why? Like there's not, you know, <laughs> the frogs are here. Yeah. It's it's bad enough getting to here and the only reason I'm doing it is for the frogs. So I think it's all about passion and and that gives you the grit and the determination, right? I'm doing it I, I'm passionate about what I'm I'm doing and I'm I mean, we definitely do have fun, but it is also really horrible in <laughs> many times, you know, freezing and shaking, you know, the mount the, the some of the mountains in northern Vietnam are really, really cold and some of the last yeah. trips that we did were absolutely miserable at night. You know, we would go out looking for frogs, come back and we didn't even have hammocks then. So we just had a bit of plastic on the ground with that was sort of looped over our heads as well. And we're all sort of lined up right next to each other in sleeping bags. And I had a better sleeping bag, which is hypothetically waterproof, but waterproof doesn't mean waterproof in the sleeping bag. But so I took the side because I thought I could handle some rain spray. And I woke up in, you know, the... I don't know, say three or four o'clock and I'd slid down into the bottom because it was on a slope. I was in a pool of water up to my knees <laughs> and it was freezing. <laughs> and it was just like, I actually really hate this right now. <laughs> you know, it's, but, but you're also miserable together and it is that sort of sense of if I was by myself, there's no way I could do that. But we're all miserable right. together. So, um, and, and it's, you know, I, I've, I've recently done some sort of been involved in some filming stuff and seen, you know, worked with some amazing documentary makers and realized, it, wow, you guys are just as insane and you have to carry like camera gear in at the same time. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it, but it's all passion and yeah. And it, it's, it is all that. If you've got something that you really care about, then you'll go through it in order to get what you believe in. And, you know, I believe in figuring out what frogs are where and, telling people how amazing they are and hopefully contributing towards their conservation. Um, you know, I, I still work in Southeast Asia and I'm increasingly working back a lot more in Australia as well. And it can be just as insane. Some of the terrain and some of the places that we're working mm-hmm. in, um, you know, some of the really crazy, you know, forward driving to get into sites and then climbing down waterfalls and things. I, you know, I'm not... I think my mum would probably be a lot happier if I didn't do some of the things that I do, you know, in these remote places, texting her to let her know that I'm, you know, that we're back safely every night and stuff. Um, but, you know, it's, yeah, all the people that I work with, I'm I'm so lucky to work with people that are similarly passionate and, and that's what life's all about. It's working towards goals together. And yeah. And what's that feeling like when you're, you've slept in water for the last seven nights, you've hiked up, hundreds of th- not thousands of meters up to a stream and you find a frog that you've never seen before yeah what? i mean it's 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 fantastic i mean to be fair sometimes you know that you found something that's really really crazy for example uh in central vietnam we came across a pink and yellow frog with spikes on it and so at that Whoa. point I don't even know what this frog is related to, never mind that nobody, you know, not it's not got a scientific name. Crazy. Other times you go in the field and you find all these tiny small brown frogs and you're like, I think this could be different. Like it sounds a bit different or it's got a slightly different pattern on it. Um, but there are a lot of what we call sort of cryptic frog species in that they don't need to know that each other's different by looking at each other. They go by 
their calls, they maybe go by pheromones, they go by all sorts of different things. And so they're not made for us to identify them. Um, and so sometimes we don't actually know if we've got new species in the field. So it's not until we actually go and we download the call recordings that we've made of them and analyze the, their little calls, or we analyze their DNA and figure out, oh, wow, that is actually, you know, there's been a couple of times where I thought we found one species and then I realized it's actually two species. Um, oh, wow. And then when I look at it closely, I'm like, oh yeah, I can see this one, you know, has uh, a bigger stripe down the side and it has more webbing on these toes. But it's, it's a lot of detective work in many cases to actually discover the frogs and describe the frogs. Um, and you need lots of evidence to be able to demonstrate convincingly to yourself, but also to the reviewers for you be, to be able to publish a manuscript that sort of names the species. And, and that's ultimately when you have described or officially named the species. And it can take years, actually, from the time that you're in the field until you've actually got the manuscript and you've given the frog an official name. And for me, it doesn't stop at that point either. So I'm heavily involved in assessing the conservation status of wildlife as well. Mm. So one of the biggest things that I, I, we do is uh, me and my team, we sort of discover the species, describe the species, publish the paper that gives them their name, and then work out how threatened they are as well. Um, and so unfortunately, many of the species that I've been lucky enough to co-discover with my colleagues and name are actually also now endangered or, or even worse, critically endangered in some cases. Um, which emphasises to me the urgency of the work that, that me and my colleagues are, are doing as well because we're discovering species that are already perched on the edge of extinction. Yeah, you find that pink and yellow spiked toad and you're like, this is awesome, I'm going to name it. It gets named, but now it's like, how many of these are there and can we save them? Exactly, exactly. What is the level of, I hesitate to use the word intelligence, but... I have no idea like how smart or social structures of amphibians in general, do they exist? What is the, I know it's, there's so many different species, so I'm speaking in broad strokes, but I just I love a little bit more of an understanding there. I think we don't know yet, really. Uh, certainly there is some intelligence potentially particularly in some toads i think it varies a lot with species for most frogs potentially instinct is is what is needed uh, they need to be able to react really quickly when they see some kind of food object um you know they they kind of know that they're meant to go at this certain time you know when their hormones change to to breed in a, in a swamp um but we also have these teasers of kind of intelligence, if, if you will. I think we're only just starting to get to the tip of, of what, you know, a, a frog thinks. Um, many mm -hmm. frogs can live a very long time. So 20, 30, 40 years even, which we really? don't think of. Yeah, not, wow. not all species certainly, but, but many can. And so you think potentially that, that as well, that might mean that particularly those species might have a few more cogs going going on um toads can uh eat food that's not moving as well so they can sort of figure that out and and they'll for example sometimes like eat dog food out of a, a dog bowl um but other than that we know that frogs can can home if you move a frog away you know they'll be able to get back and we don't know how they navigate particularly well um, we know that they can get back to the same pond that they they were actually, oh, wow. you know, born in um, and migrate huge distances to get back to that. So there's something going on. Um, but we've there's been very, very little into how intelligent frogs are. So you could relocate certain species of frogs like miles from their pond and they'll find their way back? I think depends on the species, but certainly, yeah, they've, there has been Whoa. experimentation done where they've moved frogs but put little radio transmitters and stuff on them and seen how they move back to where they're going. Um, and, yeah, so there, there, is, there is a fair bit going on. Um, we just wow. don't know how much and, and what exactly. <laughs> we, you mentioned, obviously, the, the pregnancy test and that uh, certain frogs are adept to doing that, but I was listening to your TED talk and you mentioned a few different science and health applications of the chemicals that are produced by the skin of amphibians. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah. So frogs are essentially living in these, mostly living in rather wet, damp places like swamps and rivers and streams where they actually 
pretty likely to get infected by all sorts of different things, viruses, bacteria, fungus. Um, and so different species of frog have different uh, chemicals that they secrete onto their skin, peptides in most cases. And they're actually really being explored increasingly for human medicine, particularly in the age of antibiotic resistance, where we're looking to need different drugs for ourselves to stop mm -hmm. us from getting killed by uh, bacteria. Uh, we're investigating frogs and different species have different chemical cocktails on their skin. They're being used uh, to sort of explore anti-tumor, anti-cancer, anti-viral, anti-HIV, anti-fungal. Uh, some secretions on frogs are actually being used, uh, investigated for contraceptive use as well. Uh, oh. Drug delivery systems, the frogs that foam up their eggs uh, apparently create bubbles that pop at a constant rate and so could be used as a drug delivery system. Wow. Um, a really awesome frog, that uh, the Holy Cross frog from Australia, and I've actually experienced it kind of gooey me so some frogs will puff up and some toads and they'll sort of you can actually see the secretions in their skin and it's often a defensive behavior so it's to stop a snake from eating them or another predator to just sort of goes oh god what is that weird puffed up animal and and it's secreting things let's just back off or in some cases uh. maybe it might gum the mouth of of the snake or whatever it is up by having these goose so the holy cross frog actually secretes a really really kind of gluey substance that I've gotten on my hands and not being able to wash off. And Ugh. this is actually being used, uh, explored for use as a glue for sort of humans internally. So in sort of knee cartilage repairs and things like that, to have a glue that you can put inside because it's actually as sticky and effective a glue when it's in a wet environment which is what frogs are used to, as it is in a dry environment. Yeah, in dry environment. So there's all sorts of things that frogs are producing to protect themselves or to solve their own problems, uh, which are now being used to potentially help us as well. So I guess when we think about losing species, another thing that we can think about is actually that we're losing potential benefits to ourselves in terms right. of medicine and, and actually that includes painkillers some of the most toxic frogs are producing uh, alkaloids that that are really effective painkillers more than morphine and things like that as well so we really might have frogs to thank in the future if if we can have them stick around that's for sure yeah and then there's also those uh the small population of the the psychedelic frogs of people licking them <laughs> oh there is oh, there is that there is that but uh, yeah, i don't think the frogs benefit much from that i mean and having no. frogs in your neighborhood is also potentially really good because the tadpoles will battle it out with mosquito larvae so they might reduce mosquito oh, yeah, populations yeah. as well so there's a lot of selfish reasons that we might frog want frogs and in many parts of the world frogs are also eaten as food and many places rely on frogs as a source of protein as well and in in many ecosystems there's probably a quite a sustainable harvest of frogs going on as well um so there's there's a lot of reasons that we want frogs yeah that's super interesting i never i had no idea about any of that before i, I listened to your ted talk which i'm going to link in the show notes and everybody listening should watch i wanted to hop into some quick rapid fire questions here what would you describe as the most beautiful frog you've ever seen Oh, rapid fire. I'm not good at that because I think they're all beautiful. I definitely would say that the Vietnam mossy frog, uh, it looks like a lump of moss. It really does. And when I first saw one of those frogs, I almost lost my mind because I'd been looking for them for about seven years. So Vietnam <laughs> mossy frog. And unfortunately, because of their beauty, they are actually targeted for the pet trade, which is not a good thing. We should all just admire their photographs and go see them in the wild. <laughs> yes. How about the strangest, like craziest behavior uh, type of frog that you've seen? Craziest behavior. I, I do like a good frog fight. So there are frogs that will wrestle with each other. And these tiny little frogs, uh, about a month ago, I was watching fight with each other and make little grumpy squeak noises and then actually try and tip the other frog over on its back and I uh, yeah I'm it, it was one of the most amazing things that I've seen so little frogs wrestling is the cutest thing how would you say <clears throat> for listeners can you list off a few groups or organizations that you think are worth supporting that 
do a really good job in helping to protect amphibians. There's just so many places that you can spend your oh, there is. donation dollars where, who, who would you say is at the top of the creme de la creme of the amphibian conservation? Oh, well, I've, of course I'd have to say the Australian Museum if you're, <laughs> if you're in Australia <laughs> or you're visiting Australia. Um, but I, I think, honestly, the, the best thing to do is to support your local organisations. I really do think from ground up is, is one of the best ways and not, not necessarily in terms of money but in terms of, of manpower. Get involved in citizen science. Get down to your local creek and help rehabilitate it. Work on providing habitat for your local frogs. Um, and that might be for giving money to the local organisations that are doing that kind of stuff um, and, and educating kids, taking school excursions down to these places um but i i i would definitely go for the local organizations doing on the ground work wherever you are and get involved if you can how about your favorite book and favorite documentary oh wildlife related um oh my gosh you know what i haven't read like, terrifyingly, I've just been reading scientific papers. I, I don't read too much either, time. so I'm, I don't um, feel bad. I do listen to podcasts a lot. Uh, I mean, I, I, David Attenborough for for any kind of wildlife documentary, of course. Um, oh, yeah. It, yeah. The OG. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you, you can't you can't go past that. And I've grown up watching that kind of amazing amazing documentaries which are hopefully putting people closer to to nature in any you know any way that people can get closer to nature the better even if they're sitting on their couch watching the nature nature if, if they're watching it then that's amazing um, 100%. i think marty crump's book in search of the golden toad was really inspiring so uh she was a you know female biologist working in in the tropics in search of frogs, incredibly passionate. Um, even bought her her young child, you know, doing field with field work with her in the forest. Um, so it is, I guess, those stories of adventure and 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 sort of forging new paths. And and she was she was an amazing, and she still is an amazing woman. So um, if you can find uh, Marty Crump's book, uh, In Search of the Golden Toad, that's pretty inspiring. Awesome. As always, we'll link these in the show notes for people looking for more. Uh, how about the year? How about your next five years? What are, what are you working on? Big goals, big projects. What can people look out for? Definitely still Frog ID, which is the National Citizen Science Project. Who knows? That might end up in your country if you're not in Australia. But if you are in Australia, definitely so. download that um, and record your local frog. So I'm working a lot on that. Um, expeditions in search of uh, species, undescribed species in particular still, so both in Australia and Southeast Asia, uh, continuing to work out which places and which species need our help the most and hopefully just spreading the frog love around the world as much as I can. <laughs> and my last question is if you could take a billboard and put it on the side of a major highway, and disseminate one message in 10 words or less, what would that be? Oh my gosh. Um, I, I, yeah, it's something either along the lines of, you know, go visit your local national park or, or get out there tonight, you know, see some wildlife or pushing the message of, of that we need wildlife. There were some amazing, uh, I don't know if they were billboards, but there were ads, I think, out of Canada a while ago, which were uh, a picture of photographs of people just covered in insects uh, in their kitchen or in their lounge room, just insects everywhere. And the wording was along the lines of the world without frogs or we need frogs. So <laughs> I, I think they did a pretty good job on that. So I'd be pushing people to get out there or pushing people to understand that even in our kitchens with, you know, nice clean kitchens and things that we are connected to, to the outside world and everything that we have, you know, is derived from nature one way or the other. Yeah. It's so important. And that's why I think things like frog ID is so in citizen science is so great to get people involved because I truly believe there's nothing better that 
we can do in the world of wildlife and conservation than to get most people out into natural experiences to experience it themselves, uh, which is something that is increasingly rare as time goes on. But Jody, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm going to link to everything from your website and social channels, as well as Frog ID and the link to download in the show notes. I am no longer embarrassed at my lack of amphibian coverage on this podcast. So thank you so much for taking the time. You are an absolute badass. I mean, talking about, I, I, I think you're underselling how crazy going into these rainforests and going to those extremes to find these new animals. It, it, it's just, it's absolutely incredible. So thank you so much for all the work that you do. And for everybody else listening, until next time, stay wild. Thank you so much for listening. I honestly cannot express how much I appreciate you taking the time. For all information regarding this episode's guest, social channels, books, how you can support, etc., please check out our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast. We are everywhere that you can find podcasts. Subscribe to Escape the Zoo on YouTube, follow Escape the Zoo on Instagram, like Escape the Zoo on Facebook, and please share with your friends. It honestly goes so far and means so much to me. And lastly, if you'd like to be emailed with each new podcast and any other major Escape the Zoo updates, visit escapethezoo.tv and sign up for our email list. Thank you.